go. Let's go. Hey, this doesn't mean that it's okay now to screw it up. It's not. Well, the crowd's not. Remember, remember, it's being recorded. All right, everyone, good afternoon. I am Ben Pearson. I'm the Command Senior Chief here at the War College. Uh, in lieu of or celebrating our birthday in CPO 365, we're going to do a presentation today on the USS Chief. Uh, we don't have the Senior Enlisted Academy class here, which kind of ruins my opening joke or, or icebreaker. Uh, but we've got a good variety of chiefs. We've got some retired chiefs, I see, uh, retired master chiefs, our active folks. We don't have our brothers or sisters from the other services. Uh, but we do have a group of prospective chiefs as well uh, for all the first classes that are here. So again, good group. Uh, we're going to go over some things, USS Chief, the history of it, and then celebrate our birthday as well. So there'll be some neat stuff that goes on today. Uh, bear with us. Some of us, this is our first time presenting. Uh, but I promise you it's going to be a good presentation. We're actually recording as well. So if you want to make some noise at the end and all that kind of fun stuff, please do. I'm going to turn it over to Wyan one Terrell, and he's going to give introductions. Thank you, Senior. Good afternoon. I would like to welcome you all to our presentation of the USS Chief. I would like to first start off by introducing our group members. First, from the Naval War College, myself, Wyan one Terrell, Wyan one Hood, EM1 Tapote, and YN1 Morse. From Naval Station Newport, it's going to be GM1 Lucas, NC1 Jones. And from Naval Health Clinic New England, HM1 Perez. Attention to the Sailor's Creed. Thank you. I'd like to introduce our first presenter. It's going to be YN1 Hood. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Professor Hood from the War College. I'm going to be covering um, the first USS Chief, AMC 67. It's more commonly known as the USS Bold, but it was originally named USS Chief. But back in the 1940s, they actually had a tradition where they were naming all of the ships after characterizations. So it was renamed to the USS Bold in May 1941. It was turned over to the Navy in May 1942. And to present, the next is USS Chief AM 315 is gonna be H1 Perez. Good afternoon. I'm H1 Perez Mendez. I'm going to be talking about the second USS Chief. The second USS Chief was an AUK class minesweeper. It was named after a chief, after being a head of a group, leader of a group. It was originally intended to be in the service of Great Britain as HMS Alice BAM 1. It was reclassified USS Chief AM 315 in January 1943. It was commissioned in October of 1943. Its crew was 100 sailors. Its max speeds was 18 knots. In February of 1973, the USS Chief was sold to the Mexican Navy, and it was renamed the ARM Jesus Gonzalez Ortega C-93, and it still remains in service with the Mexican Navy 72 years after first being built. To talk about the World War II service of the USS Chief, I'd like to introduce GM1 Lucas.
Thank you, H1. Good afternoon. I'm J1 Lucas. Today we'll be speaking briefly over the courageous events of World War II as it pertains to the USS Chief. Under the command of Lieutenant Commander Wyckoff, the USS Chief departed San Diego in December of 1943 to head to Hawaii for training and exercises. The training and exercises would be cut short, though. In January of 1944, they steamed to the Quelijan Atoll were in support of the battle where they performed the anti-submarine patrol and the convoy duties to the Inwinotok patrol. This was the first time that the American forces had broken through the Japan Pacific sphere to establish a foothold for our, our invasion forces. In February, the chief returned to Pearl Harbor for repairs. Upon completing her repairs, she continued her exercises in the Hawaiian waters. When then she was tasked in June to join Task Force 52 in the Inwantaka Toll, where she performed the mine clearing duties and fire support for the invasions of Saipan and Tinian. In August, she then returned to Sandy, <coughs> excuse me, she then returned to Pearl Harbor, escorting the cargo ship De Grassi, then returned to San Francisco for overhaul. After a short break in the yards, she then returned to the Hawaiian waters for more training. In May of 1945, she steamed towards Okinawa, Japan, where she was the flagship for the hydrographic survey of Uten Co and developed the Minecraft Typhoon Anchorage. She remained, on, she remained there until August, where she would then steam to Wakayama, Japan, and formed occupational duties until September, excuse me, until October. Where the Shin, for the occupation forces, where the, she then remained on occupational duty until the 10th of March, 1946. She returned to San Francisco at, during that time, and she received five battle spars for her valorous actions during World War II. On the 17th of March, 1947, she was placed out of commission and <clears throat> placed on reserve until the cry of battle called her again. I'll tell you that story, I'll turn it over to Petty Officer Jones. Thank you, Jim. In 1952, the USS Chief was brought back into service after being de decommissioned for five years to support the United States' efforts in the Korean War. In August of 1952, the ship arrived in the war zone where it joined other ships in the mine division in and around Wusan Harbor. The primary task of these ships were to sweep the channels and harbors to allow larger vessels access for naval gunfire support. The USS Chief was awarded two battle stars for the two tours it completed after being decommissioned in 1954. I now turn the floor over to Ian one Tapote to talk about the last and final USS Chief. Afternoon, I'm Ian one Tapote. Talk about the USS Chief MCM-14. She was the third ship to bear the name and the last of the 14 Avenger-class type ships. In earlier times, they were called mine sweepers, uh, last, mine destroyers, mine killers, mine hunters, and we know them as now as mine sweepers. Mine sweepers are completely made out of wood. Because of this, they don't have a magnetic signature. So they can safely cross over minefield waters and not blow up. <laughs> so the type of mines that uh, they look for is floating, moored, and bottom. And the goal of these ships is to find them and destroy them. Uh, the types of equipment that they use to complete these tasks is all from sonar, remote control, Mini submarines equipped with video cameras and a self propelled acoustic device that uh, sends these pulses of noise through the water, and any mine that's close by will detonate. They also have magnetic influence cables that they tow behind the ship, and they pass electricity through them, and they create a magnetic signature or as to simulate a carrier or a destroyer, amphibs, and it'll set off any type of mine that's close by. So you see, our mine countermeasure ships were very important. They still are today. 
before our sailors and Marines hit shore, before they hit the beach, uh, before we go to the hostile waters, these ships are there to clear the passageway for us. Now the USS Chief's keel was laid on 19th of August, 1991 out of Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin, built by Peterson Shipbuilders. She was christened by Mrs. Susan Bushy, uh, the sponsor of the ship, and she's also the wife of the seventh McPond, Master Chief Bushy. Later on, after receiving her on behalf of the Navy, she was commissioned on November 4th, when my last, November 5th, 1994, by our first captain and crew, Lieutenant Commander, Timothy Garrell, and now we'd like to show you a short video on the commissioning of the USS Chief. Thank you. In the Navy, the word Chief is associated with an enlisted sailor who's moved up the ranks and earned the title Chief Petty Officer. But recently, the Navy welcomed a distinctly different type of Chief, the minesweeping countermeasure ship USS Chief. This chief became a welcome addition to the Navy's Atlantic Fleet in a commissioning ceremony on November 5th at the Little Creek Amphibious Base in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Opening the ceremony was the officer in charge of Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin's Supervisor of Shipbuilding, Lieutenant Commander Thomas Schotter. I'm particularly honored today to participate in Chief's coming of age for several reasons. First, because her name is Chief, honoring all the Navy's Chief Petty Officers past, present, and future. Second, because Chief is sadly the last of the Avenger-class mine countermeasure ships. The Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy, John Hagen, then spoke, explaining why Chiefs are such an important part of our naval force. History and tradition are vitally important to Chief Petty Officers in the Navy. We are not just middle managers of a great corporation, but leaders of a truly great institution. Virginia Congressman Owen Pickett echoed Master Chief Hagan's remarks. It is the chiefs that symbolize and perpetuate and teach this element of pride to the people that they manage and the ones that they train to carry on the traditions of the United States Navy. After the ship's crew boarded their new vessel, the USS Chief's commanding officer gained some advice from a special chief the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Mike Borda. You carry a special trust, for your ship bears the name Chief, and she must embody all the great, inspiring, and wonderful name, things that that name symbolizes. Lieutenant Commander Timothy Scott Gerald concluded the ceremony, mostly speaking about his crew. They took this fine ship to sea after an excellent light-off exam, and have operated her as though they have been doing it for years instead of only days. I could not be more proud of them. With a name like Chief, this new Navy ship should have nothing but success. Reporting from Norfolk, I'm Navy journalist Scott Matlock. Good morning, everyone. Wine One More, Station Naval War College. Our guest speaker today, Professor Timothy S. Gerald, career spanned over an impressive 32 years, beginning in 1974 with this enlistment in the Navy. He reached the rank of STG-2 before he attended the Naval Academy via the Boost Program. I believe my last, 1974. He is a graduate of the Naval Academy, class of 1981. He served on numerous operational platforms. He was the pre-commissioned commanding officer of the USS Chief, MCM-14. He was also the commanding officer of the New York MEP station. He retired in 2006, where he began his tenure here at the Naval War College as the Fleet Seminar Program Manager. Please welcome to the stage, Professor Timothy S. Gerald. Well, thank you very much. This is... Uh you know, this is a real honor today, but I, I have to start by saying that I think probably one of the biggest honors in my life um, was when I was uh, assigned as the CEO of the USS Chief. 
Um, watching that video today, I, you know, I haven't seen that since, uh, since 1994. It's hard to believe it's been almost 20 years since we commissioned Chief. But, um, you know, it, watching the video today, I, I just keep, I'm reminded of how at, at every turn, um, there was just an association with the Chief Petty Officer Corps, just an association with the Chief Petty Officer Corps. Um, Master Chief Bushy, who was the, uh, the chairman of the commissioning committee, uh, he relayed to me a, a short story about how, how the, ch the ship was actually named in the first place. Uh, and, and it was as simple as the Secretary of the Navy, Lawrence Garrett, the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Mike Borda, and Master Chief Bushy, when he was McPon, were sitting in the office one day, and the, the topic came up that they needed to name the last three or four ships in the Avenger class of minesweepers. And uh, Admiral Borda looked at Master Chief Bushy and said, do you remember your first chief? And, of course, Master Chief Bushy did. And uh, the CNO said, you know, I remember my first chief. Why don't we name one of the, chief, one of the ships chief? And that's as simple as it was. That's exactly how, exactly how the lineage traced back to the name for one of the, mine, the last mine countermeasure ship being named chief. Um, Admiral Borda mentioned his, his first chief. Hey, one of the topics in his, in, his, in his remarks at the commissioning ceremony was the, your first chief, and everyone remembers your first chief, and that everybody in the Navy, everybody in the Navy has a chief that they're associated with. Um, I have some notes here. Uh, well, let me back up for just a second. Uh, so Master Chief Bushy was my commissioning committee. My commissioning committee consisted of six former Master Chief Petty Officers of the Navy. So as you can probably figure out, I didn't really have to do anything. Uh, some, one, of my, one of my good friends was the commissioning CEO of USS Champion, number four. Uh, his commissioning committee was his sister and his mother. And so they they were challenged. I mean, they, they, they contacted the Champion Spark Plug Company and asked for donations, and they, they contacted the Champion Sportswear Company and some other things. Um, one, of the most, one of the most important things that, that any commissioning committee does, for those of you that haven't been associated with a commissioning crew or commissioning uh, evolution, <clears throat> they raise money because the, because the Navy only appropriates a certain amount of money for you to do the things that are nice to do during a, at a commissioning a commissioning ceremony. The commissioning committee, because they're not uh, because they're not a government an official government entity, they can raise a lot of money. And believe me, uh, six former McPons raised a lot of money, a ton of money. We had we had so much money that um, when the commissioning ceremony was completely done, there was a pot of money left over. And so there's actually a USS Chief scholarship now, and it's managed through the Surfland Scholarship Fund. Um, they put that whole pot of money in there. Master Chief Bushy's wife, Sue, was the, was the ship's sponsor. And I'm telling you, what a grand lady she was. Um, she was. She was the director of the Family Service Center in Norfolk. Uh, and then when, when she retired, she became, the CNO named her as the, uh, the ombudsman at large. Now, sadly, we lost Sue a couple of years ago. Uh, but, but she was just a, a wonderful, wonderful sponsor. And there's, there's a... There's a, uh, the ship sponsor gives a gift to the ship when the ship is commissioned. And, and Sue gave uh, one of the lone sailor statues. Uh, and he sits, on, uh, he sits on the bridge of the chief uh, on the, up in the, uh, right by the, by the quartermaster's table. And his nose is really shiny because, because they rub, at least they always did, they rub the, the, the lone sailor's nose for luck. So he was, uh, his nose was always shiny if the rest of him wasn't. Um, Let's see, talked about. Okay, so first chiefs. I, I want to talk about first chiefs. So Admiral Borda named his, it was, it was a, a chief by, by the name of George Everding. Um, I've got a couple of first chiefs too. Uh, because I was prior enlisted now, my, the, the first chief that I, the first chief that I ran across in the Navy, I'm going to tell this quick sea story. The first chief I ran across in the Navy, I had no idea who he was. Because in my senior year in high school, my, my dad and I had a conversation about me going to college the next year. And we both agreed that it was going to be a waste of my time and his money. And um, I mean, I was, a, I was an OK student, but not a real dedicated student. So uh, he thought, well, maybe you should join the, the military for a while. And thought, that would be a great idea. Um, so I thought about it, and I went back and forth and back and forth. And I decided to join the Air Force. I liked what they were doing. I wanted to have something to do with airplanes. So. Uh, Partway through 
the second half of my senior year in high school, I headed for the, the AFE station and the recruiting station in Bangor, Maine, and to see the Air Force recruiters. Well, when I got there, the Air Force recruiter wasn't there. So I was sitting outside the Air Force office waiting, and this Navy Chief Petty Officer came down the hallway, and you can see where this is going. He said, uh, oh, are you here to join the Air Force? I said, yeah. He said, great choice, great choice. And then he started asking me the questions. Uh, about to graduate from high school? Yeah. Going to graduate on time? My dad told me to say yes, sir, to everyone. Said, yes, sir. And the chief said, don't call me, sir. I'm a chief. I said, uh, then he started asking, ever been in trouble? No. Uh, well, what do you want to do in the Air Force? So I told him this, that I had done this, this homework and I wanted to be an aircraft structural mechanic. He said, you know, we have airplanes in the Navy. I said, oh, really? He said, yeah, aircraft carriers. And I said, oh, wow, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's pretty neat. He said, why don't you come down to my office and have a Coke while you're waiting for the Air Force recruiter to show up? And so I went down there. and. I, the rest is history. I, I learned uh, when I was running the, the MEPS in New York, I learned that's called poaching. But uh, so my dad thought I had gone up to the, to the AP station to join the Air Force. And uh, I was only 17 at the time. So when I got home, I said, hey, I, I talked to the recruiter today and I'm going to join and everything's good and I'm going to have a physical and, and all these things. And, but because I'm 17, the chief needs to come down and talk to you. Well, my dad worked for the Air Force at the time. So when I said the chief needs to come down and talk to you, he expected an Air Force E-9 to show up. Um, so you can imagine his surprise when, uh, when a Navy chief showed up. And uh, the, rest, the rest is history. My dad was a, my dad was a corpsman uh, during the Korean War in the Navy, so, so the Navy runs, runs pretty deep. The next chief that I was associated with was when I was a young enlisted man on the USS Talbot, and that was a, a, a chief sonar technician by the name of Gene Hollibaugh. And my next association with Gene Holabo was when I was delivering my remarks during a commissioning ceremony, Master Chief Holabo, retired at the time, was sitting at about the third row, and every time I looked at him, he just shook his head and laughed. He couldn't believe that Seaman Gerald had, uh, had, was going to be the CEO of the, of the USS Chief. Um, my, the first chief I was associated with on the USS Chief was a guy by the name of Ken Moeller. And Ken had been the, he'd been the, uh, on the commissioning crew of the USS Sentry. So he asked to be on another, a second commissioning crew and specifically uh, worked with his detailer to become the, 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 the commissioning chief sonar technician on board uh, chief. And boy, when I first got up to Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin, which was the, where the ship was built, there was myself, another chief, my chief engineer, and about a handful of sailors. I mean, we really had a very small crew. And then that was, that was different because up to that point, I had always joined crews that existed. I had always been the new guy. Well, we were putting this, putting this crew together, and I was really blessed that I had uh, Ken Moeller, and I wish I could remember Chief Whitmire's first name, but anyway, the chief engine man. And then as in dribs and drabs, as the rest of the crew and the rest of the officers started to, to filter in and, and man the, you know, fill up the crew and man the ship, uh, we, got, we got things going. I've got... Another chief who has adopted me and has adopted my family by the name of Keith Steika, a, a gunner's mate. Um, and just to show you that, that the, mentoring, the mentoring role of a chief never ends, um, my daughter is in the Navy now. She's a lieutenant out in San Diego, and Chief Steika still mentors her. High tech, via Facebook, but he's always contacting her and asking her how things are going. When she posts something about what she's done, he always answers back and says, hey, this is, you know, it's just, it's, it's really neat and gratifying, I think, to see that, 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 that my chief from all those years ago is, is still mentoring my daughter. I have another chief in my, in my life. My wife, Vicki, her dad's a retired master chief. Uh, he retired as the command master chief up at Great Lakes, and the day he retired, uh, behind him, the, he graduated on the big, or retired on the big parade field. Uh, on the signal hoist were some signal flags, and he embarrassed me. He said, "Well, you should know what that means." And I said, "Well, yeah, I mumbled something incoherent, I'm sure." But but he had hoisted a signal for my wife, who was in the Navy at the time, and myself. And the signal hoist was, "My wake, your course." So little did I know that day, because we were lieutenants. Little did I, I had no no idea that I would ever. You know, command a ship with, with such a rich background and a rich tradition as, as the USS Chief. Um, but I said earlier how, how things just kept looping back. You saw on the film also that Master Chief Hagen was Mick at the time. Well, Master Chief Hagen and my father-in-law 
uh, were shipmates. So, so at every turn, through my entire association with the USS Chief, there was another really nice, really fine you know, association with, with Chief Petty Officers. It was just, uh, it was just, it was really, uh, really something. Let's see. Okay, Sturgeon Bay. Boy, Sturgeon Bay is heartland America. If you haven't been up in that area of Wisconsin, Sturgeon Bay, though, just, just good people. And I got to tell you that the craftsmanship on the USS Chief. I have a book down here, and it has some photos in it, some eight by ten color glossies of the ship through the through the uh, through the building process. I got to tell you, the 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 quality of the craftsmanship on that ship was unbelievable. I mean, I'll just give you an example. One day I was I was sitting on the mess decks. And uh, I happened, I looked up, and the ceiling tiles, they had the, you know, the stainless steel frames for the ceiling tiles. They had slotted head screws, and every single screw was lined up perfectly fore and aft. Someone, whoever the craftsman was that put those ceiling tiles up, had taken the time to line up every single one of those. And, and that was what you saw, what you would see today if you went on board the chief at every turn, was the quality and the craftsmanship. And it was just... Just a wonderful, wonderful thing. Now, also in the, in the video, you notice that Tom Schauder, who was the director of shipbuilding up there, mentioned that the USS Chief was the last MCM. And, it, and it, really did, it really did symbolize or signified the end of a way of life up there. Peterson Shipbuilders, the, ship, the, the company is not even there anymore. The shipyard is gone. It's a, it's a really nice little town park now. But um, if you look in the, in the book and, and you, you see the, the shipyard, and at one point, um, MCM 9 through MCM 14 are all there. And that was uh, um, Peterson Shipbuilders started building uh, uh, submarine chasers for during the Second World War and had a long tradition of building uh, naval vessels. But, uh, but Chief was the last. So, so when we sailed away from Surgeon Bay, it was, it was kind of bittersweet, kind of the, the end of an era. Um, a funny story about the, the day we sailed away. There was a civilian. Uh, a civilian boat yard there, and they had built over the about over the same period of time that they were building Chief at Peterson Builders. This other civilian boat yard was building this private yacht for some billionaire, and the name of the yacht was the Dancing Bear, and it was about 20 feet longer than Chief. But every time there was a social event, and every time there was a reception or something, the guy who was having that ship built, he had a helicopter pad on the back of his ship. I didn't have one of those. But every time that we were together in a social setting, he, was, he, would always, he would always tell me how jealous he was of me because I was, I was going to be the CEO of a U.S. Navy ship. And yeah, he had a yacht. and It was a nice yacht and everything. Well, the very first time we ever got Chief underway, we came about literally about five feet from T-Bone into Dancing Bear because, you know, it, we, a new pre-com crew and... We, we really focused on, on EOS and all the things down in the engine room, but on the day we got underway, it turns out that control of the starboard shaft hadn't been passed up to the bridge. So when we went to back down the starboard shaft, the ship didn't back down. And we kept <laughs> all back. On an MCM, for those of you that haven't been on, you, you, it, it, you all, all back two, all back three, all the way up to all back 10. And so we were all back 10, and the ship was still heading toward the Dancing Bear when suddenly, or, or Fortunately, I guess, and suddenly, the, someone down in engineering discovered it, that the control of the starboard shaft hadn't been passed to the bridge, and they passed it up, and then it answered the bells. And we, uh, To those standing on the shore, they said it looked like a perfect maneuver. The, the, the owner of the shipyard, Ellsworth Peterson, told me, he said, you got a little close to Dancing Bear there, but other than that, it was pretty good underway. I said, yeah, we, we really did get real close to the Dancing Bear. <laughs> too close, way too close. So our, so our first... Our first sea detail was the St. Lawrence Seaway. That was exciting. Um, you know, we had we had we had gone through all the training and all the, you know, all the uh, you know uh, fast cruises and everything that we could, and we had had one day underway where we had gotten underway out on, on Lake Michigan and come back in. But the next time we got underway was in October 1994, and um, <clears throat> we headed for the headed for the St. Lawrence Seaway. That, has anyone in here ever been been on a ship through the St. Lawrence Seaway? It's exciting. Um, they have these thousand-foot lake freighters. They're huge, and and the locks, as you as you as you lock up and down in and out of the St. Lawrence Seaway, these locks are big enough to hold one of those thousand-foot lake freighters. And they have 
these things they call approach walls, and they're these ugly concrete walls with timbers on them and big iron stakes where ships have torn the timbers off and everything. Well, you know, here I am with a brand new ship, and it's a wooden hull, but it's got a, it's got a fiberglass sheathing on the outside, so it's, it's brand new, and it's a little delicate. Uh, relatively delicate. So the way these big lake freighters get into the, into the locks is they just power their bow into, the, into these approach walls and the approach wall pushes the bow over and they go into the lock and they close the door, they close the, the lock gates behind them and they either dump the water out and they go down or they pump water in and they go up. Well we were always, it's called going down on someone else's water. We were always Coming out of the Great Lakes, you're always going down. So we were always going down on someone else's water. Well, the first uh, lock that we approached, um, we got a little bit too close. And I didn't think the physics through. If you think about it, this 1,000-foot ship fills this lock. The volume of the lock is filled by this ship. Well, when they open and they, they raise it up in water, well, when they open the door and the ship comes out, something has to fill that, that lock up. Well, it happened to be the water I was sitting in. So I was all back full, but the water I was sitting in was, was rushing into the, into, the, uh, into the lock. And so the chief is only 224 feet long. So you can imagine that we, we scooted in there, managed to get stopped without hitting anything, made a mental note, don't get so close next time. And then uh, they closed the door behind you, and it's like the tidy bowl man. I mean, they... they, they pull the plug and the ship just drops. And some of the drops are 69 or 70 feet. So you, you pull into the lock and, and they, they pull the plug, the ship drops down and then you continue on because there's another big ship you know, waiting to, to come in behind you. One of the neat things about that trip was, and this was totally unplanned, it was absolutely fortuitous, but we crossed Lake Erie on the Navy's birthday that year. And we went right by a place called Put-In Bay. And Pudding Bay, Put in Bay is where Oliver Hazard Perry and his squadron went out into Lake Erie to take on the British during the War of 1812. Um, that's the, the, the famous battle where he flew the battle flag that said, don't give up the ship. And um, of course, that was because James Lawrence was killed on Chesapeake. And as he was dying, he was the captain of the Chesapeake. As he was dying, he said, don't give up the ship. Oliver Hazard Perry. So it was neat that we were able to celebrate that day. We were crossing Lake Erie, celebrate the Navy's birthday, right at the point where Oliver Hazard Perry. I always, I always look for things like that to, to work on the tradition, to instill, try and instill the tradition in, in the crew, just like this thing here today, this, this event today is, you know, it's, it's about tradition, it's about pride. Uh, let's see. I wanted to read something. Uh, I have Admiral Borda's remarks here from that day, and I'm not going to read a lot of it. <clears throat> but Admiral Borda said, what a great day for Navy people and for our Navy. For the second time in our history, we will have a warship named for a very special group of Navy professionals, the chief petty officers of the finest, strongest Navy in the world. Chief, what a great name for a great Navy warship. Chief, the very name says it all. The best, number one, a winner in every way. What a great name. He went on to say, Chief, what a great name for a ship. The title Chief raises so many memories for all sailors. Every one of us who has served for any length of time can tell you about his or her chief. I talked about that earlier. I think I have one more. He said, we know, every sailor knows that the word leadership and the title chief petty officer go together. You cannot say one without thinking of the other. Senior chief asked me to talk about the crest, the, the ship's crest. Um, I, actually, I actually designed the chief's crest sitting right over here in the Sioux Chalet. I was in Newport for, the, for PCO, and this was in... 1993. Now, if you if you remember 1990, if you remember back, that was a time when there were there were a lot of sensitivities being expressed about about Native American um, heritage and Native American pride, and and some groups were saying that the tom things like the tomahawk chop and uh, you know sports teams named after Indian tribes or Indians and things were were, were maybe not the right thing to do. So the Navy was very concerned. Uh, well, not the Navy. 
but there were some in the Navy who were very concerned about what we were doing as far as what the ship's crest was going to be. Uh, they didn't know that the they didn't know that the that the ship was named after the Chief Petty Officer Corps. They thought maybe we would take it in a direction where we might offend some Native American group. So I got a call from a a captain in the in the Pentagon and wanted to know what direction we were going, and I was able to say, well, no, but it's named after the Chief Petty Officer Corps. So, so as you go through a commissioning process, there are certain, certain things that you have to hit, and one of the things is you have to, you have to develop the ship's crest. So I started with, the, uh, I started with, the, with the, the standard rope around the outside and the blue on the inside, USS Chief MCM-14, but then the center was really, was really left up to me. So I, I came up with this idea that we would take the, the, the Master Chief Petty Officers of the Navy insignia and we'd have the, we'd have the fouled anchor like you see there. I took the, uh, we have, if you look on the ship's crest, there, are, there were 84 crew members in the commissioning crew. So there are 84 links on that chain on the ship's crest. I looked at um, the, the stars on the upper, on, up above. It, it kind of worked out nicely because the, the Mick Pond has three stars. It has one on each, on each uh, of the sides of the anchor and one at the top. That also coincidentally is the, is the arrangement of the three green lights, the three green navigation lights at night that indicate a vessel engaged in mine clearance operation. So we had that. So we, we got it all together. The, in the center of the crest is a mine. And I had, I had two swords going through it. And I, I, uh, I had this all done. And I sent it up to the to the commissioning uh, the commissioning crew that was in Sturgeon Bay at that time, which was about it was it was Chief Moeller, Chief Whitmore, and I'm sorry, Chief Whitmire, and the uh, and my chief engineer. And Ken Moeller immediately sent it back and he said, "Hey, how come the officers get two swords going through the mine? Why don't we put a cutlass through? It is the USS Chief. Why don't we have a cutlass?" So if you look at the at the design, there's an officer's sword going through and a, and a and a chief's cutlass going through. So then. After you, get the, after you get the design done, the Office of Army Heraldry is the, is the, they're the clearinghouse. Every, regardless of what service you're in, they have to authorize, they have to approve your, your crest for heraldry. Well, I submitted it to them and they rejected it. And the reason they rejected it was because you're not allowed to have any uh, military rank insignia on an official unit crest. So because we had essentially the you know, Chief Petty Officer uh, insignia, they said, no, you can't do that. So I really wanted to do that. I thought, well, hmm. Well, I had another chief in my life at that time. If you remember, I had Dwayne Bushy, Master Chief Bushy. So I called Master Chief Bushy and I said, Master Chief, they're not letting us have the, because we had sent it to him and he liked it. And he'd sent it back and said, this is great. I said, Master Chief, they're not letting us have the, the ship's crest that we want. He said, I'll make a couple of phone calls. And I'm not, not a word of a lie. Later that day, he called me back and he said, he said sir, we're going to tell Army Heraldry to pound sand. We're going to have that as the, Admiral Borda said, that's the ship's crest, and so that is the ship's crest. So again, another example where I had my chief looking out for me, and you know, he, he had my back. Um, let's see. I think that's about it. But one more thing I want. I want, I want to read one more thing from, from Mass Chief, or from uh, Admiral Borders. Okay, covered everything. As I said, I was, I was just overwhelmed, overwhelmed with pride at being the CEO of the USS Chief. Trust me, I, I, as a matter of fact, Chief is, Chief is currently in San Diego, and um, I was there two years ago, and I had to be on base early in the morning, so I arrived about 7.30, and I had some time to kill, so I, so I thought, well, I'll just drive down to the pier and take a look at the chief. Um, so I did, and I happened to be there, first call to colors. Um, so I was standing on, I, I decided, well, I'm going to watch colors on my old ship. And I was standing on the pier, and I'm not, a, I'm not a, uh, ashamed to say that when I, while I stood there and the national anthem was playing and I was looking at my old ship, I was bawling like a baby. I was just overwhelmed with the pride that I still felt, you know, almost 20 years later at having been, been blessed to be the CEO of the USS Chief. It was just, it was overwhelming. And um, 
I keep telling my daughter, I said, you've got to go over to the chief. Chessa, go over to the chief and, and uh, you know, just tell him, hey, you're, you're the pre-com CEO's daughter and you want to get on board and take a look at the ship. And she hasn't done it yet, but my wife will tell you that my daughter can procrastinate. <laughs> but, I, but I wanted to end with this. And they showed a little snippet of Admiral Borda saying this, but, but when I, again, when I think back to the, to the absolute, you know, the, the absolute blessing that I had in my life of being the CEO, the first CEO of a ship named Chief, Admiral Borda turned to me in, in his remarks. He said, Captain Gerald, you have a special charge. Your ship carries the special title, a very special title, as her name. You bear a special burden and you carry a special trust as a skipper of a proud ship with a proud name. Chiefs are leaders. Chiefs really are the backbone, the heart and soul of the Navy. If you or if a captain who follows you must take this ship into the fight, you must prepare her to do her duty just as so many great chiefs have done their duty in so many places, in so many ways, in so many fights before you. Chief is more than a name. It's a symbol, a tradition of all that is good and honorable in the greatest navy the world has ever known. I envy you. Every sailor here envies you. For you, as commanding officer of USS Chief, will have the opportunity to carry on in the finest traditions of one of the proudest and most important groups of men and women in our navy. I know that you, your ship, and your crew will not let us down. You will. You must be the best. You carry a special trust, for your ship bears the name Chief and she must embody all the great and inspiring things that her name symbolizes. So I want to thank Senior Chief and the, and the 365 folks for inviting me here today. This has been really a, a great opportunity to, to walk down memory lane, and, and uh, I'm just thrilled to death that I, you know, when I look back on my Navy career, that one of the things that I was able to do was I was able to command the USS Chief. Thank you. Again, thank you, sir. I'm going to bring the first classes back up. You guys, please come on up so we can acknowledge them. But as we do this and we think about our 365 program, uh, when I think about it, I go back to a couple weeks, maybe a month ago, I think, when we started talking about this. And Juan One Morris came into my office, and he looked like a kid at a candy store. And he was just so excited about what was going on and the fact that he had met Professor Gerald and, and learned about the pre-commissioning CO working here at the War College. Uh, and so as I think about CPO 365 and what it means, you know, I, I think it means, hey, we learn something every day. And hopefully after this that we've all learned something. But it's also networking. Uh, and I'll say that having four commands represented here and the way that you guys came together, that's what it's about being in a chief's mess. So you're on the right track. Our CPO 365 program is on the right track. Uh, and since we're on the subject of networking, I wanted to present you guys something. I went through CMC school with Command Master Chief Longsdorf, who is the CMC on the USS Chief. And as we talked about, pardon my fumbling around, but as we talked about the crest, I wish, sir, you would have had one of these so you could have seen it. Uh, but I have Chief's Mess coins from the USS Chief uh, to present to you guys. So great job. All right, you guys can exit now. <laughs> okay, and last but not least, it is our birthday. Uh, for those that are in the khakis, understand some of you guys will be soon. But I'd be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity uh, to read something. If you hadn't looked at it today, I'm going to save you, uh, and we're going to read it now. So, Chief Petty Officers past and present, attention to the Chief Petty Officers Creed. During the course of this day, you have been caused to humbly accept challenge and face adversity. This you have accomplished with rare good grace. Pointless as some of these challenges may have seemed, they are valid, time-honored reasons behind each pointed barb. It was necessary to meet these hurdles with blind faith in the fellowship of chief petty officers. The goal was to instill 
in you that trust is inherent with the donning of the uniform of a chief. It was our intent to impress upon you that challenge is good, a great and necessary reality which cannot mar you, which, in fact, strengthens you. In your future as a chief petty officer, you will be forced to endure adversity far beyond that imposed upon you today. You must face each challenge and adversity with the same dignity and good grace you demonstrated today. By experience, by performance, and by testing, you have been this day advanced to Chief Petty Officer. In the United States Navy, only in the United States Navy, the rank of E-7 carries unique responsibilities. No other armed forces in the world grants the responsibilities nor the privileges you are now bound to observe and expected to fulfill. Your entire way of life is now changed. More will be expected of you. More will be demanded of you. Not because you are an E-7, but because you're now a Chief Petty Officer. You have not been merely promoted one pay grade. You have joined an exclusive fellowship, and, as in all fellowships, you have a special responsibility to your comrades, even as they have a special responsibility to you. This is why we in the United States Navy may maintain with pride our feelings of accomplishment once we have attained the position of Chief Petty Officer. Your new responsibilities and privileges do not appear in print. They have no official standing. They cannot be referred to by name, number, nor file. They exist because, for over 121 years, chiefs before you have freely accepted responsibility beyond the call of printed assignment. Their actions and their performance demanded the respect of their seniors as well as their juniors. It is now required that you be the fountain of wisdom, the ambassador of goodwill, the authority in personal relations, as well as in technical applications. Ask the chief, is a household phrase in and out of the Navy. You are now that chief. The exalted position you have now achieved, and the word exalted is used advisedly, exists because of the attitude and performance of the chiefs before you. It shall exist only as long as you and your fellow chiefs maintain these standards. It was our intention that you never forget this day. It was our intention to test you, to try you, and to accept you. Your performance has assured us that you will wear the hat with the same pride as your comrades in arms before you. We take a deep and sincere pleasure in clasping your hand and accepting you as a Chief Petty Officer in the United States Navy. Navy Chief! Navy proud! Navy Chief! Navy proud! Navy Chief! Navy proud! Ooh, yeah. Ooh, yeah. That's it, social at the CPO Club at 1600, thank you.